Okay, so today we're going to look at techniques for solving um, these linear second order differential equations. Um, but we're going to start very specific. Like already, we're saying we have to be linear. So that reduces a lot. Um, we're also going to be doing homogeneous. So we're going to be equaling zero. But then the one other thing we're going to do is we're going to make sure that all of our coefficients, so all those functions, you remember the P of X and the Q of X, so we're going to make sure that those are all constant. So this huge world of second order differential equations and we're looking at this little tiny bit of them. But knowing how to solve this little teeny tiny bit of them will help with the rest. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. So let me go ahead and write up an example on the board so you can see what I mean. So if we're going to make ourselves have coefficients, just constant coefficients, we're basically looking at things of this form, where we have a times y double prime plus b times y prime plus c times y equals zero. So this is the structure of what we're going to deal with today. So a, b, and c are all constants. Um, they can be zero with the exception of a. Right, having a equals zero is silly because then we're back to just a first order and we already know how to deal with those. Okay, so linear, second order, homogeneous, with constant coefficients. I really don't know if we could put many more qualifiers on this, but there it is. All right, so let's first just talk about a strategy for trying to solve this. Um, and we're gonna start kind of like we did way back with the ones that were first order. And we're gonna look at what kind of function might actually work here. So if all we're going to do is multiply the function and its derivatives by constants and add them together and still somehow get zero, what kinds of functions might work? Can you think of any? So Monty just put in continuous. Yeah, we're definitely gonna need continuous functions, but I'm, I'm looking for more like a specific, you know, kind of function like polynomial, logarithm, trig, exponential, right? So Bren just put logs. So let's think about logs. Could logarithmic functions work? Well, what do you know about the derivatives of logs? What do they look like? Typically one over something. Okay, uh, whatever so whatever is contained within the, the Yeah, logarithm. so let's just think fractions, right? So the derivative is going to be a fraction. And then the second derivative, so the derivative of the fraction is yet another fraction. So we'll have fractions plus fractions plus logs. It's going to be kind of hard to make that equal zero because those logs are going to stick around. What about trig functions like sine and cosine? Okay, so what about sine and cosine? Because that will f flip sines every time you take the derivative of cosine, so. So you're right, we do know that sine and cosine, their derivatives are also sines and cosines. And sometimes they have opposite signs, plus or minus signs. And so for sure, there are going to be combinations of these, depending on the letters, that will make it so that sine and or cosine will work. So, yep, I like those. There's a biggie. Polynomial functions. Okay, so I, I didn't catch what the two on top of each oh. other were. One was polynomial. Oh, uh, linear functions. Okay, so linear are also polynomial. Okay, so let's think about polynomials. You differentiate polynomials, what do you get? Uh, 
the same polynomial drop down for the power and constant taken away. Okay, so it's it's another polynomial, but degree is decreased by one. So then when we take a second derivative, we get another polynomial, again decreased again. Um, but think about that. Like let's say that y was had x to the n. So there's an x to the n in here. When we differentiate, we're never going to get another x to the n. And that will never go away. So um, fortunately, polynomials aren't going to win. So I gave you a hint by saying it was a big E. Oh. It was a big E. <laughs> Sorry. That's the one I had said, but. I just not hear you say that, Ian. I'm ignoring nah, you like that, always. That's when we all toss said the same thing. Oh, okay. So what about exponentials? <sighs> right? Derivatives of exponentials are exponentials of the exact same form, which means their second derivatives are also exponentials of the same form. So we should expect to see exponentials from time to time as well. Now, will there be other things? Potentially. But really, all the solutions we're going to find to any one of these can be some combination of exponentials and trig. Now, the other thing to remember is since this is second order, we're going to need to find a group of two. Right? We need two functions to form a fundamental set, aka a basis. So we're going to actually have to look for more than one. But let's do this. Let's just see what the conditions would be, what necessary conditions would be for a solution to be exponential. So let's just try this. Let's make a guess of y equals e to the r. So I'm not going to specify what that power is. But let's just see if we have e to the r, and then we need to have a variable in there. So let's go e to the rt. So basic exponential. So if we go without y, then y prime is going to be r e to the rt. And y double prime is going to be r squared e to the rt. And if we put that back into the differential equation, we're going to get a r squared e to the rt plus b r e to the rt plus c e to the rt has to equal zero. So I'm just making a guess, but if that is, if that's going to work, then I know this purple polynomial has to equal zero. So I'm going to divide out the e to the rt, because that's always positive. So I can divide it out. It's not a big deal, and it's everywhere. So that actually leaves me a r squared plus b r plus c equals zero. So if our solution is going to be of this exponential form, the r that we're putting there has to satisfy this quadratic. So this polynomial, we give it a name. We call this the characteristic polynomial. And so really what we're going to do when we start to try to solve these things is look for solutions to this polynomial. And it's really easy to build because the a, b, and c are the same a, b, and c. And it's just a quadratic with those. All right, well, let's think about what can happen when we solve this is one of three things happens with quadratics. We either get two real solutions, 
to complex solutions or just one solution, right? There are those three different cases. So let's kind of talk about those three different cases and what that does in terms of our solution set. So let's say we get two different R's. So when you solve that polynomial, we get R1 and R2. We'll call this case number one. And so when I put here R1 and R2 are solutions, I mean to the polynomial equation, right? They're not solutions to the differential. Okay, well, our guess was Y equals E to the RT. So that then suggests that one of the two functions is going to be E to the R1T and Y2 is going to be E to the R2T. And this is by far best case because those two different real values that were solutions to the polynomial equation give us two different functions, which means we now have a fundamental set. So that's the dream. That is definitely the dream that we get those two unique solutions that are both real. All right, so cool. Cool for that one. Well, let's actually look at one so you can see how this goes. All right, so how about this? Let's say we have y double prime minus 4y prime, say plus, no, what is a minus 5y? equals zero. So we make our polynomial. The polynomial is going to be r squared minus 4r minus 5. All right. So this one we can actually factor. This gives us r minus 5 times r plus 1. So we get solutions of 5 and minus 1. So we're in a case of two real roots. So that makes y1 be e to the 5t. And then y2 is going to be e to the minus t. We know that they are linearly independent because one is not a constant multiple of the other. So we know that that actually forms a fundamental set, which then means if we want to go to a general solution, we need linear combinations of these. So I'm going to write c1 e to the 5t plus c2 e to the minus t. And that's what every single one of the solutions to this differential equation look like. You obviously can change your c1 and your c2 to be different values. But as we saw before, and at least in the context of linear algebra, the basis spans, so we know that the solution is all linear combinations of them. So this is why I was saying this is the best case scenario, because it's super easy. Once you get those R values, you just put them in as your exponents and you're done. Um, I do want to mention, sometimes when you do this, you don't get like integers or um, well, rational numbers, sometimes you get irrational, you get the square root stuff. Doesn't change anything, right? Like um, 
when you solve, you know, when you do like the quadratic formula, you get one plus or minus root three or whatever. Well, those are your R's. You have e to the plus one plus root three t, and then e to the one minus root three t. All right. So cool. We like case number one. And the only other thing that might get added onto this is if it's an initial value problem. But if it's an initial value problem, you just put those numbers in here and you do your thing. Find your C1 and C2. All right, so let's go to the more interesting cases. What about if we don't have the two real solutions? All right, well, the next one I want to look at is let's go to just one solution. Okay, so this is going to be case number two. So case number two is that we get only one solution. So let's just say well, we just get, only get one solution. And while we're at it, let me go ahead and give you an example of one because they are not that uncommon, but this would be something like y double prime. Now how about this? Four y double prime minus four y prime plus y equals zero. So if you were to make your polynomial, you have four r squared minus four r plus one. That does factor to 2r minus 1 times 2r minus 1. So we get r equals 1 half. So this is exactly what I'm talking about is this kind of situation. All right, so quiz for class. Why do we have to treat this one differently? Uh, because it has a multiplicity of two. But why is that a problem? What's the problem with having multiplicity of two? I mean, you're right. Well, what from it? from what I recall from pre-calc, I believe, it, instead of uh, just being a point where it just hits that x-axis, it's going to hit it and go back down, right? Uh, Am I remembering that correctly? <laughs> Do we think of it in terms of like lambdas from linear algebra and it's not spanning? That's really what we want to look at. Um, oh. it, you're right, Thea, that on a graph, when it's multiplicity two, it comes down and bounces off instead of yeah. passing through. But let's think more of the linear algebra idea. With eigenvalues. And nope. Not oh, even eigenvalues. Oh, no. Not even eigenvalues. Think about what we're trying to do here. We're trying to build a fundamental set. Yeah. How many functions do we need here? Oh, it's a repeated. Oh, got it. Right. We need two functions. We need a y1 and a y2. And the one half, that's great. It gives us one of them. It just we wouldn't be enough to span the solution space. You have to find. Yeah. Got it. So, let me go back to the board. Okay, so we got one half. That's awesome. That tells me that one of my two functions is e to the one half t. So if we go to the general case where we only get one solution, we know that one of the functions is going to be e to the rt. But we need a y2. And I can't just use e to the rt again. Why not? What's the problem if they're both e to the rt? Because that would not make, that's not linearly independent. Boom. That's exactly it. They're not linearly independent which was kind of the whole point. Okay, so you can see why this one's not quite as good. 
I mean, we're halfway there. I'll take half. But unlike the first case, we don't get both sets right away. All right. So what do you think? What do we do? Couldn't you just try to find another function that's not a um, a multiple of the other? And wouldn't that span the, spa uh, span the solution space? OK. I mean, yeah, we're trying to find another one that's not a multiple, but that's not an easy thing to do. Yeah. Like, you can just randomly try to pick stuff. You're probably not going to be successful. Well. What's sort of been the common theme so far in differential equations when you know a function and you need to find another? What have we done a lot? You guys are going to kick yourself as soon as I tell you. Yeah, I'm going to take the IF meaning integrating factor. Oh, fuck. We're going to do an integrating factor. We're going to say, okay, so Y1 was E to the RT. Y2, let's have it be some form U times Y1. And let's figure out what that U needs to look like. All right, so here's what I suggest. Let's actually do it generically. So then we can apply it to something like this one that we just did. So everybody remember this differential equation that we had partially solved. But let's see if we can go through a generic, what's the process look like to find this guy u? Okay, so here's what we're going to do. If that's y, if y is going to be u times y1, we need its derivative, and we need its second derivative. So we're going to have y2 prime is going to be u prime times y1 plus u times y1 prime. Haven't used the product rule. Really. And then we also need y2 double prime. So we'll do the product rule again. So we're going to get u double prime times y1 plus u prime times y1 prime plus another u prime times y1 prime plus u times y1 double prime. So let's put those into the differential equation. And we'll go back to that generic a times y double prime plus b times y prime plus c times y. So if we put that stuff back in, we're going to get A times all this stuff. I went ahead and combined those middle terms because they were identical. And then we're going to have B times the derivative. And then we're going to get C times the original function. And that's going to equal 0. All right, so, so far so good. So now let's kind of lump everything together. And I'm going to group things according to the derivatives of y. Uh, no, actually, check that. Check that, check that. Let's put in 
y1 and the derivatives of y1 because we know what y1 is it's e to the rt so if we put that in this is now going to look like a times u double prime e to the rt plus 2u prime r e to the rt plus u times r squared e to the rt okay, that was that piece i'm gonna run out of space let me jump up here so a times u double prime e to the rt plus 2u prime r e to the rt plus u r squared e to the rt plus b times u prime e to the rt plus u times r e to the rt plus c u e to the rt Because again, remember what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out u. All right, well, every one of those has an e to the rt. So I'm going to go ahead and divide that out. So what we get then is a u double prime plus 2ARU prime plus AUR squared plus BU prime plus BUR plus CU equals zero. All right, so, so far so good, ish. I mean, it is what it is. But now we're gonna kind of split this up a little bit more. Look at the parts that don't have R. So we get AU double prime plus BU prime plus CU. So that was, those three chunks so i'll go ahead and put those in blue parentheses and then the other bits i've got 2ar u prime plus aur squared plus bur Now, what do you know about the stuff in the parentheses? Isn't that our differential? No. So that comes from our differential equation. Yeah. Absolutely. And what we know is that u times y1 is a solution to this. So if I were to put the e to the rt back in there that I had removed, then that y1 is in here. And so this is going to be equal to zero. Got it. From our differential equation. Okay, so this bit equals zero, boom. So now let's look at the 
other piece here and see what might make that equal zero. Because again, we're trying to solve that for u, right? Well, this is now 2ar times u prime plus, I'm going to rewrite this as u times a plus b times r. Oh, wait, no, 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 not what I wanted to do. I wanted to write it as a r squared plus r times u. Now here we have to actually look at this with multiple possibilities. The one is r equaling zero. If r equals zero, this is true. But I want you to think about what that means in terms of the very beginning of this, right? So one option here is r equals zero. If r equals zero, this is true. But remember what I'm saying is that r is the only root to the polynomial. So it's a repeated root, which means that polynomial would have started as r squared equals zero, which means this would have come from a differential equation that would have been y double prime equals zero. That's the only way we get r equals zero as a repeated root. Bruce, isn't it supposed to be a r squared plus b r times u? Uh, yes, thank you. Luckily, that doesn't matter for this part. But thank you for that, JP. Okay, so r equaling zero as a repeat is just y double prime equals zero. And this one is super easy to solve. He says, hoping that you guys agree. Because <laughs> you just integrate twice. You integrate once to get y prime, integrate twice. Basically, this is it's a linear function. So y has to be a linear function if we're ever in this situation. So that's not the part I care about. The part I care about is, well, what if it's not r equals 0? Okay, well, if it's not equal to zero, then this thing is separable. And we can go ahead and solve it. And I'm just gonna cut to the chase. This tells us that u prime has to equal zero. So uh, the other option, so if not this, um, it's actually that, well, no, let's go ahead and do it. So if we separate, no, you guys don't care, that's fine. Let me just tell you what happens. Okay, so if we go through this process, keep going, it turns out that this forces you To be linear. So what we're going to do is we're going to take y2 and we're going to multiply it by a linear function. So y2 is going to look like c1 plus c2 times t times e to the rt. But this is way more than I actually want to include in Y2. First of all, I can pick my C1 and my C2. So I'm going to. 
Um, but I want you to notice if I were to distribute this, I get something that looks like that. And specifically, look at the first part. That's actually one of the parts of the Y1. Yeah. So having that as part of my Y2 is not necessary because it's already incorporated into the Y1. So I'm going to let C1 equal zero because I don't care about that piece. So then since I can pick anything I want, how about we just let C2 equal one? So we knew that Y2 had to be some linear function times Y1. So I'm going to use this guy. So T e to the R T is a solution. And it's definitely not linearly dependent with Y1. Because if I take Y2 and I divide by Y1, I get T, which is not constant. So they are not constant multiples. <sighs> OK. But here's the good news. We did this once. We never have to do it again. But here is your fundamental set if you get a repeated root. So if you ever get just one solution to that polynomial, go ahead and write e to the rt, because that's part of it. But the other part's going to be t e to the rt. So that makes our general solution exactly what we found with the integrating factor, actually. That y is going to be c1 e to the rt plus c2 t e to the rt. But definitely more complicated because of the fact that we only got one solution for our fundamental set and we needed a second. Ugh. All right, well, let me show you an example. And we'll make this one an initial condition problem. So let's go back to the one that we did. Remember we had um, four y double prime minus four y prime plus y equals zero. Let me even add on an initial condition. Let's say that y of zero is one and y prime of zero is negative one. So initial value problems now, we're going to have to have two pieces since we're going to have two constants from integration. So we already did this. We found that r was equal to 1 half. So that means that our solution then is going to look like c1 e to the 1 half t plus c2 times e to the 1 half t. So we get that e to the rt in both pieces, but one of them gets a t attached. But now let's go and find our c values using the initial condition. So y of 0 equaling 1, that tells us 1 is equal to C1 plus 0. So C1 is going to equal 1. All right, well, to get C2, we're going to have to differentiate. So let me put that C1 value in since we've got it. This is e to the 1 half t plus C2 t e to the 1 half t. So let's get y prime. It's going to be 1 half e to the 1 half t. This other piece, we need to use the product rule. 
So we're going to get e to the one half t plus one half t e to the one half t. And now if we use y prime of zero equals negative one, that gives us negative one equals one half plus c2. So c2 is equal to minus three halves. And so putting that all together gives us a solution of y equals e to the one half t minus three halves t e to the one half t. All right, so repeated root, not nearly as nice. But now that we did the work once, it's actually really easy to build. So whatever your R is, one function is e to the RT. The other one is T e to the RT. All right, so any questions on case number two there before we jump into case number three? And it's at this point, you should probably be really nervous. Because what's the third case? Imaginary. <laughs> yeah, we're going to get complex numbers. We're going to get i. And so, crap. What do we do when we have i? Well, let's see what we do. All right, so here's case number three. Case three, this is that we get two complex roots. So that means when we go and we solve, we're going to get r is equal to a plus or minus bi. So hopefully you remember that when you get complex roots, they are conjugates. So they're the same form. There's just one is a plus and the others are minus. All right, well, if we kind of go with the idea of they were exponential, this is kind of suggesting that y1 is going to be e to the a plus bi, and y2 is going to be e to the a minus bi. Great. But having i's in your exponents probably does not sit very well. Well, luckily, we can deal with that. We're going to get sneaky. We're going to go back to power series. So I'm going to ask, but I already know the answer. Who remembers the power series for e to the x? Okay, that's what I thought the answer was. Nobody. Well, that's all right. So e to the x, if we go back and you look at the power series, um, it's the sum from 0 to infinity of x to the n over n factorial. Kind of ringing a bell? I was so close. <laughs> I was so close when trying to remember it. So it's x to the n over n factorial. So let's see what happens when we take e to the i. Now I am going to write it out. 
So we're going to get 1 plus i plus i squared over 2 plus i cubed over 6 plus i to the fourth over 24 plus and so on down the line. But I want you to notice that every other one of these is a real number. Yeah? Yep. Because i squared is minus 1. i to the fourth is plus 1. i to the sixth minus 1. i to the eighth plus 1, and so on and so forth. So let me group those. So this is going to be 1 minus 1 over 2 factorial plus 1 over 4 factorial. The next one will be minus 1 over 6 factorial, then 1 over 8 factorial, and dot, dot, dot. I went back to the factorials just because uh, it's easier than writing out the big numbers. OK, so that was every other one of these. So I'm just going to cross them off that we already took care of those. So now let's go to the odd ones, the odd powers. They all have an i in common. So I can factor that out. And then if we look at what's remaining. The same sort of pattern forms, but it's just what it's being divided by, they'll be slightly different. Yeah, this ends up being the odd powers, right? Or the, the odd uh, factorials. So we're going to get i and then 1 over 1 factorial. I know we usually write it as 1, but I want it as 1 over 1 factorial. And then we're going to get minus 1 over 3 factorial plus 1 over 5 factorial minus 1 over 7 factorial, dot, 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 dot. Um, shouldn't it just be 1 over 1 factorial minus i squared over 3 factorial and then so on because even so though we factored be, out i it so would still I, be the powers right okay so when i pull out the i the powers drop by, down by one and i squared is negative one i to the fourth is positive one i to the sixth is minus one and so on the joy of reworking with complex numbers <laughs> Okay, but there is kind of a nice pattern going on here, which we're going to make use of in just a second. So that would be e to the i. Now, what if I actually did e to the i t? Because that's actually where we're heading. I just realized that I should have had a t up here, All right? Because it's e to the r t. But let's see what happens when we take i times t. Well, the only thing that's going to change is that we're also going to get t's in here, right? Like this one is going to be i times t. This one's going to have a t squared, t cubed, t to the fourth, t to the fifth, and so on which just means the tops of these now have powers of t. So this is going to be t squared over 2 factorial, t to the 4th, t to the 6th, t to the 8th. Similarly, over here, this will be t to the 1st, t squared, or no, sorry, t cubed, t to the 5th, t to the 7th, and so on. So that's what changes if we actually put a T in there. All 
All right, so another question that I think I already know the answer to. Does anybody recognize these power series, the things that are in parentheses? They're al alternating, right? It's an alternating series? Or? It is an alternating series, but each one of those is a specific function and a function that you know. Isn't it sine and no? Hmm. So your other hint is you know them and you probably love them, but you don't love them like I love them. Sine and cosine? Yeah, these are sine and cosine. This first one is cosine. Oh, this is, oh, this is, oh, cosine plus I sine. Yeah, this is Euler's oh, formula. Oh, shit. <laughs> so you may have run into this at some point in your past life. It's, it's one of those quirky things that we math people like to show you from time to time. It's called Euler's formula. And it's if we have e to the i t, that equals cosine t plus i sine of t. So when you have complex numbers, you take e to a complex power, you actually get sine and cosine. Okay, so let's keep going with then what our solution is going to look like because now we can actually break it down. So let's look at the first one here. We've got E to the A plus B I T, A plus B I times T. So this is E to the A T times E to the BIT. So we're going to E to the AT. And then this other piece, let's use Euler's formula. So we already know what the E to the IT does. It becomes cosine T, I sine T. What happens when I've got a B in there? Where's that going to go? Well, think about what we were doing. We, we plugged in I into the power series, and we put IT in, and it just showed that T showed up everywhere. We put a B in there. That B is going to show up everywhere, which means this ends up being cosine of bt plus i sine of bt. And this is another thing that you may have seen in trig. It's like the fast way of doing algebra on complex numbers, is you can turn it into trig. When you raise to a power, it's the same as multiplying the angle. All right, so that's this one. So what about the other one? What if it's A minus BIT? Well, you can put the negative B into cosine and sine. So this is going to be e to the a t times cosine of negative b t plus i sine of negative b t. And then we can use the even and oddness of these functions. Cosine's even. So having a negative inside is the same as not having a negative inside. You can completely ignore that. And then sine is odd, which means the negative inside 
can come out. So what we get with that one, and I'm going to write it just above it real quick, is going to be cosine of BT minus I sine of BT. So that's what this thing turns into if you use the even and odd. So we're almost done. We're almost ready to create our fundamental set. I mean, we still have an issue. We got those pesky eyes, right? Well, let's think about what we're doing with these because we're adding linear combinations of them. So what we're going to have is C1 times the first plus C2 times the second. And our y equals C1 e to the at times this one with the plus. And then c2 times the one with the minus. So let me just distribute and then group them according to the cosines and the sines. So we're going to get c1 plus c2 times e to the at cosine of bt plus i times c1 minus c2 e to the at sine of bt. So c1 and c2 are arbitrary. So that means really c1 plus c2 that's just a different arbitrary number. Same thing with the C1 minus C2. But here's what we're going to do. I never said C1 and C2 have to be real. We've never said that. C1 and C2 can be whatever we want. So what we're going to do is we're going to design it so that our arbitrary constants are not actually arbitrary. They are, but they're not. We're going to require that their difference is imaginary. So that when we multiply by i, we get a real number. At the same time, we're going to make sure that their sum is real. And you can do that. You can definitely set things up that way. So this then turns into, I'm going to call them different instead of C, but we call them K. We're going to get K1 e to the at cosine plus K2 e to the at sine. And now this shows us what our fundamental set is. Y1 is e to the at cosine of bt and y2 is e to the at sine of bt. Now I would actually argue, and this might be an argument with you guys, I would argue that case three here is better than case two. Because case three, we got two different functions that are clearly linearly independent, which we know for sure form a fundamental set. We don't have to pull any of this integration, you know, uh, integrating factor nonsense. Granted, the integrating factor was pretty easy for case two. And we ended up finding it was just a linear function. But here we don't have to do that. Okay, so the moral of the story, moral of the story here is that when you get a complex root, a plus bi, a minus bi, the real part goes up in the exponent, the imaginary part 
goes into the sine and the cosine. Yay. Ish. Let me show you an example. So it, it's actually going to come about in the same kind of way where we're starting with some sort of a um, differential equation with constant coefficients. It just ends up giving us complex numbers when we solve that polynomial. So, for example, let's say we've got. 3y double prime minus 2y prime plus 4y equals 0. And we won't make this an initial value problem. We'll just take it for what it is. All right, so start by creating a polynomial. And you get 3r squared minus 2r plus 4 equals 0. It doesn't factor. So go to the quadratic. So we get r equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all divided by 2a. So this is 2 plus or minus the square root of negative 44 all over 6. So you see our negative in the radical. I'm going to pull that out, make it an i. I'm also going to pull the 4 out. So we get 2 plus or minus 2 root 11 times i over 6. And then the last thing I'm going to do is divide everything by 2. So we get 1 third plus or minus root 11 over 3 i. So this one gave us complex roots, but luckily we know how to deal with that now. All right, we just went through this. So by making use of Euler's formula, we know then that what this is going to give us as a solution is y equals c1. It's going to be e to the one third t times cosine of the square root of 11 thirds t plus c2 e to the 1 third t sine of root 11 thirds t. So I just took the real part, that 1 third, and put that in as an exponent. And I took the imaginary part, the root 11 thirds, and I put that in my sine and my cosine. All right, well, there's case number three. That's how we tackle these guys. So remember at the beginning when I said what kinds of functions might work here? And we kind of came up with two. We got exponentials and we got the trig. And you can see now why those are the ones, right? But also notice you can't have cosine without sine. They go together. And that should also kind of make sense. Because if we just had cosine, sure, its second derivative is negative cosine and will cancel. But along the way, we got a negative sine. That's going to have to cancel with something else, which is what the sines do. So they are paired together. They can go away if the initial conditions allow it. If the initial condition is such that it turns either the c1 or the c2 into zero, then you'll get down to just having one of them. Um, a really good example is with um, harmonic motion with springs. You may remember there that um, the function you get is either a sine or a cosine, one or the other, not both. Um, but that's just because the initial condition does that makes one of them go away. But the general solution has to have both. Because without both, it's not a fundamental set. 
Whew, okay, well, now you guys are equipped for dealing with any second order linear non homogeneous with constant coefficients. So that teeny, teeny, tiny set of <laughs> all the second orders you've got. But like I said, what we're going to see is that going forward, knowing how to do this is important. And we're going to use it moving on. Okay, so questions on any of those? Did you survive the power series stuff with I well enough to kind of see what's going on? It's one of my favorite formulas, Euler's formula, because it relates really two fundamental things, the trig functions and the exponential function, and they're completely different, and yet they're still related. <sighs> Math is beautiful, man. Math is beautiful. Okay, um, I think instead of moving forward, let's go ahead and stop for the day. Um, so I owe you a little bit of time. I know you guys are all sad, but uh, um, what we'll do next time is we'll turn our attention to the non-homogeneous. What's the process there? And you're gonna see that it comes back to solving homogeneous. So um, in terms of homework, I think I'm gonna actually put I've got 5-1 due on Friday. That was the stuff we talked about last time. I think I'm going to put 5-2. I'm going to change its date to Friday as well because it should be pretty fast. It really is create the polynomial, find the solutions, and then put in the right form. So I'm going to make that due Friday as well. Obviously, if when Friday comes around, you guys are finding that's too much or whatever, uh, I'll be happy to listen to your pleas of uh, moving it to next week. Um, but I really think that it's something you guys could knock out in the next couple of days. All right, so I'm going to stop the recording.